What's up, guys? Today we're going over myasthenia gravis. This is one of the more common, like, neuro y kind of things that kind of throw you off because it could look like a stroke. It could, like, look like Bell's palsy. It could look at, like, intermittent claudication. So, what's going on? Let's get to the root of this and I'm going to break it down. And this one's confusing at first, but. I will make it make sense as I always do. So anatomy, the biggest thing to understand about myasthenia gravis, it is an autoimmune disorder that is going to affect the way that muscles send their neuro, like the neurons send the neurotransmitters to the muscles to activate. So the neurotransmitter that is used at the neuromuscular junction to help tell the muscle what to do from the neuron being like, I'm going to lift my arm. The acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's going to be doing that. So acetylcholine is released from the synapse and it's going to cross over the neuromuscular junction. And as you can kind of see here, what's, oh, there's my cursor. As you can kind of see here, it's traveling across in a normal neuron. So this is on the left here, we have a normal one. It's traveling across and there's an acetylcholine receptor here that's going to receive the acetylcholine. So the little acetylcholine neurotransmitter is going to lock into the um, receptor and it's going to be like, yo, this is what we're doing. We're contracting. Let's go. And so what happens is if the neurotransmitters are not crossing the neuromuscular junction and adhering to those acetylcholine receptors, if acetylcholine is not binding to the receptor, then there's no muscle contraction. And then we see flaccidity. So what happens with myasthenia gravis is that there are these antibodies that are produced by the body's immune system because Remember with autoimmune disorders, the body thinks that itself is a problem and so it attacks itself. So it's attacking itself in the form of these antibodies that are blocking the receptors. So essentially neurotransmitters are coming along and then they get swatted by this antibody and they can't bind to the receptor. So what these receptors are doing is they are goalkeeping, they are blocking all the acetylcholine from attaching to the receptor on the other side. So therefore the muscle's not contracting. So that's kind of what's happening here in a nutshell with myasthenia gravis. The neuromuscular junction is the problem. The acetylcholine is not getting to the receptor because it is being blocked by antibodies produced by the body, thinking that they need to fight off their own neurotransmitters. So that's kind of what's happening with this. Understanding that motor neurons are the ones that are primarily affected by this. So we're more going to see uh, problems with myasthenia gravis when it comes to the way the muscles move rather than any sort of paresthesias. And so understanding that it's not like they're going to lose sensitivity, they're going to get really weak and fatigued. So we're not seeing that kind of the numbness and stuff that kind of goes along with like a stroke or something. It's mostly motor neurons that we're seeing with this. So acetylcholine receptors are being blocked. So how does this happen? As I mentioned before, this is an autoimmune disorder. The body is producing antibodies that are blocking the receptors that are not allowing the acetylcholine to bind and therefore there is no muscle contraction. Um, they're thinking that this could also be associated with a thymus tumor or some other abnormalities of the thymus. So generally tumors cause problems systemically that we'll see, especially if there's any sort of weird hyperplasia, hypersecretion of something, whatnot. That's kind of what's going on. For individuals that are most likely going to develop this disorder, if women are going to develop this, it will happen somewhere in their 20s and 30s most of the time. And then if men are developing this, this will happen in their 50s and 60s most of the time, which I've, from the patients, the very few patients I've had who had myasthenia gravis, this pretty much holds true. The one lady was about my age, 25, and then the other individual I treated was a 60-year-old man. So that's kind of where we're seeing this. And then also women are more commonly diagnosed with this than men. So understanding that when it comes to a, which individual will be most likely diagnosed with XYZ, kind of like adhesive capsulitis, more likely seen in women who have diabetes, those things, people who are at high risk of developing things, that's kind of what's going on. So I think a younger woman and their like childbearing years is kind of like the most common person that we would see with this. And then men developing this as they get older kind of thing in their 50s and 60s and women more common than men. So what does it look like? Here is the biggest thing when it comes to myasthenia gravis that will make everything make absolutely perfect sense. It is an extremely rapid fatigue of skeletal muscles that resolves with rest. And usually it's a weakness. It's not painful. Remember the difference between this and like intermittent claudication is, and remember intermittent claudication is the occlusion of blood vessels in the legs or the extremities due to some sort of arteriosclerosis. 
that usually ends up being painful and they have to, let's say they're on the recumbent bike, an individual with intermittent claudication will complain of pain that they need to stop because their legs are really hurting and they're getting really heavy. When somebody has myasthenia gravis, they're like, my legs are getting weak. Honestly, think of our individual that their legs get so weak, they slip out of the recumbent bike. That's this individual with myasthenia gravis. So the muscles are fatiguing super fast. And here's the thing, they bounce back after a few minutes of rest. I don't know if you've had an individual that like, they just need to sit down for a minute and then it's like they got second wind and they're ready to go. That's kind of what's going on with myasthenia gravis. Essentially, they need time to chill out rest, recuperate, so then they can get enough receptors binding, like the acetylcholine um, the neurotransmitter binding to receptor, enough receptors to be able to work. Essentially, they just need a moment to kind of, I think of like um, when you're like playing a video game or something like that, and you run out of like health, but you have to like sit there and like be like healed by healer to like let it get back. And that's kind of what's going on. So like, you'll be like doing your thing and it's like, you're out of stamina or something like that. And you have to like, wait until you get your stamina back. And then you're like, okay, you can do more now kind of thing. That's what's going on with myasthenia gravis. So here's another thing that kind of goes on with it. Proximal muscles are more affected than distal. So they'll start getting like hip weakness, shoulder weakness before they see weakness in like their dorsiflexors. So it'll be more like they're having trouble like lifting it up to get up the stairs before they're having trouble clearing the floor sort of thing. Um, here are some big keywords that the boards likes to talk about when it comes to presentation of myasthenia gravis. You're gonna see they're gonna present with diplopia. So remember diplopia, that is double vision. That is the scientific word for double vision. And ptosis is this eye drooping kind of thing going on. And this is a picture down here of an individual with ptosis in their right eye. So that's kind of what's going on. Understanding that ptosis could also show up all this droopiness. Remember that droopiness could show up with either a stroke or it could also show up with an individual with Bell's palsy. Now here's the thing, Bell's palsy will not resolve. They'll stay droopy like that, but they'll be able to lift their arms just fine. Remember our fast, our face, that's one of them. We're like, uh oh, so we're seeing the first step of a stroke, but if they can lift their arms just fine, everything else is good and like speech is fine and all that stuff besides just like, I can't really talk too well because my face is drooping, but like there's no like a, a, like aphasia or anything going on. If we're seeing that it's just the droop, that's Bell's palsy. If we're seeing the droop and then, then the droop goes away with rest, that would be myasthenia gravis. And if we're seeing the droop with the arm kind of things and the speech not making sense and blah, 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 stroke. So that's our way to distinguish what's going on with this patient. Remember the muscles of the face will start becoming paralyzed kind of thing, or the, it's less of a paralysis. It's more of just a flaccidity. It's like temporary paralysis. So like, I don't know if you see my face in the corner, it'll look like that. That's kind of what's going on with them. And then as they just chill out for a little bit, it'll just go back to normal kind of thing. Um, speech muscles, swallowing muscles can be affected. That's why if this individual is having like an episode like this. Don't get the water or anything. You don't want them to aspirate or something like that. Um, they might have some trouble speaking in the way of just like it, their voice sounds tired and it's harder to get the words out. Like they seem completely aware and comprehensive. They're having the issues just getting the words out and then it slowly improves. So like at first they're like, I'm having trouble speaking and then they sound normal. So that's kind of what's going on with myasthenia gravis. So, but also be careful because remember what is one of our skeletal muscles that we don't want to get paralyzed? Our diaphragm. So be careful in rare cases, there could be respiratory involvement. If that is happening, this person needs to go immediately to the emergency room because we do not want respiratory paralysis. We don't like respiratory paralysis, bad, very bad medical emergency. Now, what are some things we don't want to do because they will trigger an attack of myasthenia gravis? Heating this patient up, contraindication. So generally any sort of like, generally if we had the pool example on the boards, the pool's probably heated. So we don't want to put them in the pool. So this wouldn't be an individual that would be good for the pool. Any sort of stress kind of things we're seeing that they're getting, um, just any like like either emotional stress, physical stress, anything like that, bad illness will exacerbate their symptoms as well. Because remember, this is an autoimmune disorder. Remember when we have autoimmune disorders, if those individual has any sort of illness, remember they're a higher risk, higher, more susceptible because they can have these um, other exacerbations of various symptoms that cause problems. We'll see this with people with MS. We see this with people with type one diabetes, all of this stuff lupus, all these people who are immunocompromised because of their autoimmune disorders, 
their exacerbations are going to go through the roof. So we don't want this person to get sick. The big one that the board likes to focus on specifically is like an individual on the bike or something like that, or the, the individuals on the treadmill, something like that. Their legs are feeling weak and heavy and blah, blah, blah. We're thinking myasthenia gravis kind of thing. And remember, we don't take one thing in isolation. We always look at the whole entire thing and see what's going on. Pregnancy is another one. So these individuals are kind of advised of the risks when they do become pregnant, what's going on. This could exacerbate their symptoms, certain medications, as we know, with certain autoimmune disorders, certain medications will kind of freak out the immune system. And that's kind of what's going on with that, why that would increase it. Menstruation is another way that that would be increased and stuff like that. And it's kind of unfortunate because most of the people diagnosed with myasthenia gravis are women of childbearing years. So that sucks for them. It's already terrible to have your period. Imagine having exacerbation of myasthenia gravis while you're on your period. That sucks. And that's because of the hormonal involvement that that will cause that and additional stress. I mean, all of like half the people watching this are women, so they understand. All right. How are we treating it? If there is respiratory involvement, we send them immediately to the ER. We do not want this individual to have any sort of respiratory problems. That would be bad because then that means they're, yeah, we know, we know why that's bad. Um, if they're not having any sort of respiratory involvement, it just looks like it's the kind of thing they were on the recumbent bike and they're like, my legs are weak. It's like, okay, let's just be careful not to overexert you anymore. Let's not do any of these things that will overexert you, such as heat, stress, illness, increased activity, pregnancy, certain medications. And if we can avoid having our period, that would be nice. But some things like that, just avoiding exacerbations. The biggest thing with these individuals, and this is the thing the board loves, it loves energy conservation techniques to avoid overexertion. So this is an individual, you want to pace them, do a couple minutes on the bike, chill out, do a couple more minutes, slowly increase their endurance, slowly increase their activity, lots of rest breaks for this person, which is great. You give them you give them a rest break, get your documentation done and get back into the session kind of thing. Great. Chill out for a minute, get some water. We're all good. We're not having exacerbation. Great. The biggest thing with this patient is to make sure we're educating them on their triggers, which most of the time they understand them. If they're newly diagnosed, they're trying to get used to them, but patient and caregiver education to avoid triggers because we just, just having a flare up or something like that while they're trying to like drive, being stressed out. And then all of a sudden they can't feel their leg because they're trying to drive, not good. So biggest thing with this patient, avoid your triggers, educate them on that. If we're getting a general PT prescription for this patient, it will be probably under what's called general medical that you guys have seen. And we're going to be working on endurance training. So, you know, those intervals, increasing the distance each time, avoiding overexertion, teaching them those energy conservation techniques, strength training to avoid, to maximize function, to make sure if it's an individual that's more sedentary, that they still have the strength to get up transfers and everything. If there's an individual that's more active, they're able to participate in activities that they enjoy and making sure that we're not overexerting them maximizing their function without causing exacerbation. So we want this person to have as much of a functional and normal life as possible despite their condition. So keywords, as I mentioned before, guys, extreme muscle fatigue or weakness. That's a big one. We want to make sure that we're not, <laughs> that um, when we're seeing this on the boards and we see the words extreme muscle fatigue or weakness, something along those lines, we're thinking, okay, if it's not a stroke, what else could it be? Could be myasthenia gravis. If we're seeing, and this is the biggest thing, if we see that it resolves with rest. So like, remember what I said, the stroke will not resolve with rest. And we'll see the arms are all like not the same height when we try to lift them up. And we're also going to see that if it was Bell's palsy and the face is drooping, that's not going to go away in like five minutes. But if we're seeing the ptosis and then it goes away because the person's all good again, we're good. So we want to make sure that that we're seeing if it resolves with rest. If it does, we're thinking more towards myasthenia gravis, not painful. So remember, this individual is not experiencing pain when it comes to their exacerbation. They're experiencing weakness, fatigue. They're like feeling really heavy. They're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this right now. I'm like, oh, kind of thing. That's what they're feeling, more weakness kind of thing that it's just the muscles aren't moving because remember the neurotransmitters aren't going across. They're not receiving the neurotransmitters. So the muscles aren't moving. Um, diplopia. So remember double vision, that's another one. Ptosis, the eye drooping. And remember if we're seeing multiple of these keywords in a row, remember guys, we see our keywords. If we see multiple ones of them, we're like, mm, 
we're thinking we're having the red flags kind of go off. It should be check marks in the box of what you think it is. And each one should further confirm what you think your diagnosis is. And anything involving the acetylcholine receptors or the neuromuscular junction, we're also thinking towards um, myositis gravis. So sample question, everybody. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient with myasthenia gravis. The patient complains of frequent exacerbations when trying to move heavy boxes at work. What intervention should we provide this patient first? One, progressive resistive exercises to help with lifting. Two, education on energy conservation techniques. Three, cardiovascular endurance exercises such as biking. Or four, a lifting circuit with interval training to allow rest breaks. So we'll give you guys a second to think about this. All right, guys, so the answer is number two, education on energy conservation techniques. So why is this the answer? Well, what is our big underlying word? What should we provide this patient first? So what is the first thing? So they're telling you, yo, I keep having these exacerbations when I'm moving my, like these heavy boxes at work. Well, the first thing we do is tell them, hey, man, chill out, take some breaks. We need to make sure that we're conserving our energy so we don't have these exacerbations in the first place. The first thing we tell this patient is we want to educate them on the importance of having these rest breaks, the importance of making sure that we're not overdoing it. Essentially, we want to make sure that we're kind of, you know, not causing our like body to like just not work kind of thing. And so first we educate the patient. It's kind of what the PT does in their initial evaluation. First, they educate them on the pathology of their disease, what's going on with them and the plan of care going forward. And then they introduce you and be like, hey, this is so and so they work with me, blah, blah, blah. At least your PT should do that. Um, so first thing we do with the patients when we're doing any sort of new interventions with them is we educate them because then we also take into account informed consent. So understand that we educate the patient first. Hey, we need to take breaks. Then what will we do? Well, maybe we progress into I know some of you guys pick number four, the lifting circuits. We would want to make sure we progress towards something like that. We want to have our intervals with our rest breaks, but first we have to educate them on the importance of energy conservation techniques. Maybe we would add in some progressive resistive exercises to help get the weight up during those lifting circuits. Maybe we're working on cardiovascular endurance to help with like when are we start getting out of breath with those. But the very, very, very first thing we do with this patient as we're educating them on energy conservation techniques because those will help them with their activities of daily living and also with their work and everything that they do. And it will help minimize exacerbations because the first thing we wanna do with this patient, most important thing is to eliminate our, like to understand our triggers and to avoid having exacerbations. That's what I said. And then how do we treat it? We wanna make sure we do energy conservation techniques and we're trying to maximize their function as much as possible. And we want to avoid our triggers, guys. So that is what we don't wanna do with this patient. So guys, I hope that this was helpful in understanding my Cine gravis and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care, everybody.